When Ryan's is when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting. The A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind around for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rewind a Raw. John Pollock and Waiting with you here on this Monday night coming off of Raw with lots to discuss following the horror show at Extreme Rules. Are you going to miss saying that? No, I'm not. I don't think I ever really said it all that much. I kind of just went with Extreme Rules, but I think it was a a gradual uh, adoption that people took to the horror show. At Extreme Rules. What I'm looking forward to is uh, subsequent years where maybe it will be the romantic comedy at Extreme Rules, the musical at Extreme Rules, oh, the silent great. film at Extreme Rules. Like maybe this Ooh. will open up the sphere of possibilities. I mean, if there was a time to do a silent film version of pro wrestling, it would have been like two months ago. Well, I would argue that it's kind of a lot of these shows right now feel like silent films at times. Yeah, okay. They're getting a little more lively now. Now, now WWE, these N extras, I think they've kind of hit their limit because now we're getting hecklers during these shows, which I greatly am enjoying. They should. I mean, they should really like just be themselves, honestly. I mean, of course they are there. They know professional wrestling. They know when to cheer, when not to, but I I definitely think um a bit of like personality. Like let them wear what they wear. Why I don't think they all need to, like, it's so obvious they're all dressing up, like, you know, in shirts that they're being told to wear, but, um... Same it, old shit! It, Same old <laughs> shit! It just, it just, um, it kind of feels artificial, but whatever. Well, we'll get into some of the, uh, well, some of the reactions uh, that we got on Raw tonight. We have many things to discuss, Way. Let's do it. Okay, you've... I felt like you were about to say something, so I just kind of got out of the way. I felt like there was an oncoming beat. I was about to take a sip of water, which I just oh, did. Oh, you threw me. I've got water here as well. Oh, it's great. Water's great. I love water. There's never a time where I'm like, oh, water. We need it. <laughs> it's really good. We it's would, very in, We would in, not survive as, as a species without it. So, yes, it's, it is uh, the best drink. Okay, let's get into our uh, news items, and then we will run through uh, the week that is coming up. A very busy week here at postwrestling.com as usual. But we'll start off um, – let's start off in WWE because there are uh, several stories here all tied together. The first one uh, came out on uh, late Monday, and that was from the New York Post that had this story on Ric Flair. And the New York Post had reported that uh, some photographers had caught Ric Flair on Friday – uh, going through a drive through at Starbucks in the state of Georgia where he lives without a mask. And the New York Post had heard uh, through a source that Flair had tested positive for COVID-19. So when they contacted Ric Flair, he said that is absolutely incorrect. But he did state that his wife, Wendy Barlow, has the virus and said that we live in a 5,000 square foot home. I live in the basement. She lives upstairs on the third floor, and she got sick, and that was pretty much it. They uh, Flair actually hung up on them after this, but then afterwards, I guess they were whoever this reporter was uh, with the New York Post was got a text from Ric Flair who said that his health is excellent, and that's kind of what it was left at. But certainly, I mean, a very notable absence on tonight's Raw. I would have been pretty floored if we saw Ric Flair on Raw, because uh, if this is the case, his wife has COVID-19. I don't care how spaced out he is. I mean, even without this knowledge, I think many people were scratching their head at Ric Flair's continued involvement with these shows. And this, to me, is an automatic disqualifier of Ric Flair being anywhere near a performance center right now. Right now, yeah. I mean, certainly at least for the next two weeks. I mean... Uh, the risk he was taking um, was great by being a, a part of these shows, of course. Uh, but I, I guess um, I wouldn't have guessed that it would be his wife that would be the one that was positive and not him, according to him, of course. Um, 
man, I see a guy at that age in like the condition that he's he's in, or at least like he was in not too long ago. And, and I just think like, man, if I was like, if that was my parent, I would be forcing them like to take every single precaution possible, just, just out of my own concern. But I mean, of course, you know, the guy himself, I don't think would be doing these tapings unless he was incredibly adamant about it. And I imagine, uh, like many he, people, he, he is not there. doing this against like he is absolutely I, loving doing these. Like I, it's, I would it's very clear I, in the well, interviews he's done. Like well, he well, wants to be doing these. Well, like many people out there, I would imagine he would be incredibly stubborn and incredibly adamant about doing it. And um, it, it's a risk. that's where other people have risk. to be looking out for his own well being. Like that. That's where people have to be. Again, we go back to show showing leadership. This is a bad idea. Uh, of course, Ric Flair is going to be willing to get into a plane and fly to Florida every other week. We are not going to give him that option to come here. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, at this point, um, I hope he's he's being safe. I, I hope he is healthy. I hope his wife is healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hope uh, we don't see him take any unnecessary risks for a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was... I mean, it was noticeable tonight that throughout the entire show, he was on that graphic. He was on the main event graphic, but then never came out for the main event. And based on last week, like they were clearly setting something up for Ric Flair with those teases with Randy Orton and whatever was going to happen. So I, I don't know the, the full story. And I, I don't even know if he did go to Florida or not. Like th th these are a lot of questions. This story only broke about an hour or so before Raw, this New York Post story. Right, right. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor that one. It's uh, certainly concerning. Um, Mike Johnson at PW Insider reported on Monday that today was supposed to be um, the last day for Kyrie Sane to finish up with these tapings. They were taping uh, both tonight's Raw and next week's Raw, and they gave Kyrie Sane on this week's episode a big win over Bailey. So it would seem that next week's show uh, something will be done with Kyrie Sane that Rights are out. Yeah. Um, do you know uh, if she's going to be wrestling next week? They didn't announce anything, but I would think beating Bailey that they have to set up something for her next week. It, it does feel, though, that if, if they have – if today was the last day that she was working with them, it does feel like that tease of the Asuka match – uh, with everything that, that happened with Asuka and Sasha Banks on Sunday, it, it appears that the original idea was Asuka goes over, and then it seems we, we got this outcome instead where Asuka and Sasha are going to have a match next week that I don't think we're going to get the asuka Kyrie Sane match. So so you think Kyrie and Asuka was originally planned? I can't imagine you shoot an angle on your own television teasing that direction. Um, that you know, I haven't seen Raw Talk. I don't know how much autonomy like the guests have to just like go on and speak for themselves like they did in, on Talking Smack. I didn't even really see the clip, but like, could it just have been those two just saying, yeah, it would be great to have a match together? Um, I just feel that one of the issues that they had with uh, Talking Smack was they, they they didn't like how loose it got and how like Vince just was not a fan of the show. So to my belief like bringing raw talk back it was going to be done probably with a bit more oversight but it's possible that they were just shooting their own angle but um regardless i i don't see how we get to that match unless they have some like oscar's in a match next week so i, I don't know how you could uh get there but it was yeah. at least dangled but you're right not on raw proper yeah it's disappointing i mean i think um you know just the idea of oscar and Kyrie being in a match together, the fact that they haven't been in a match together this entire time with the both of them being in the same company, I think is, is, uh, I guess almost like kind of tough to believe these days with like the, how, how, how quickly they run through all these matches. And I, I would definitely say a bit of a shame if we end Kyrie's run here without at least getting that. But, uh, man, too bad. Um, we also had uh, Being the Elite on Monday, and I actually watched today's episode, and Me too. the main focus was the opening scene where the Young Bucks had a flashback to 2016 when they were in Tokyo in a hotel room with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, and 
And they're all in their Bullet Club shirts. Yes. Um, and Gallows and Anderson appear. Yes. And the Bucks are telling them about this crazy idea they have of one day starting their own wrestling promotion. Who maybe, knows? Maybe, maybe four years from now, you know, maybe on New Year's Eve. I mean, just a hypothetical. And maybe we'll get on TNT. Who knows? And Anderson and Gallows, they're all in. They love this idea. And they shake on it. They too sweet on it, of course. And then the Bucks take off. And they just laugh at these idiots and they bury the idea. They said, Hey, we're going to the, we're going to New York. We're going to be rich and famous. That's the goal here. And then Luke Gallo says, you know, I want us to get rich. I want us to get famous. We're going to team with Hunter. And I know there's two Pauls in that company. And I know that neither of them would lie to us. And then that is how this ends that they were just laughing at this, this notion of. AEW, this pie in the sky that the Young Bucks pitched them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, I see this and, and I definitely like do wonder, first of all, when they might have filmed it. And secondly, how much of this was already in the works? Because um, I feel like Alice and Anderson have been really smart over the past weekend, you know, in a few several days, like <sighs> between doing Talk and Chop and, and I guess appearing on Slamberversary and now being a part of being the elite. They've really dominated a lot of discussion um, just, you know, by doing uh, releasing all of these things in succession. And the fact that this BTE segment like directly played off of that talking shop interview that everybody's talking about, uh, specifically mentioning, you know, the entire story of how, uh, I guess, um, you know, you know, like name dropping the two Pauls in that interview and making reference to it here. Um it definitely makes you wonder, like, how quickly they might have recorded all of it. I mean, I guess did they live the, in the Florida? four of them? The four of them did post a picture together three weeks ago, like they were all together. That would be my guess of when this was do you, filmed. Do you know if they live in Florida? Uh, no. Uh, Gallows is in Georgia. Anderson is God. I Anderson was like based out of Ohio for the longest time. Okay. I don't know if he. I don't know if he's moved. See, I mean. I don't. I don't believe it was done recent, like this weekend. If that's the guess, I mean, I would say then that's a great amount of like pre-planning on like Gallows and Anderson part in 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 like you know if they did pre-shoot this prior to the interview and then in the interview, I guess specifically knowing, I guess that, that they were going to mention in particular Paul Heyman and Paul Levesque. Yeah, I mean, it was. Um, I mean, timing wise, it it, it really worked and. Yeah, to your point, I think like Anderson and Gallows, they have done a really great job of getting a lot of buzz for themselves over these uh, past 72 hours. Have you seen the trailer for Talkin' shop -a mania I have not. What, what's that about? This is their um, oh, concept it's, it's, show. It's, it's, is it um, the match between Chad Too Bad and Sex Ferguson? Yeah, this is all shot in like this field. Um, the Boner Yard match. Yes, correct. Um, I can't imagine for the life of me watching this thing, but there certainly will be an audience that watches this and loves it. You know, cinematic matches are all the rage, and uh, if if this promises to be some sort of parody of the Boneyard match, I, I definitely think there will be plenty of interest. Well, they, they are doing the parody of that. They, they're, there was a shot of that, and then they – I mean, it's just clips of – like, it's already been taped. So you've got clips of uh, Brian Myers in there, Enzo's on the show, Maria Canellis, Chavo Guerrero. Um, I mean, there's, there's a ton of uh, random names uh, on this thing. I think they have the Rock and Roll Express are going to be on it, a, bu a bunch of people. Um, I, this, is gonna be on, this is going to be on High Spots. I'm excited to see what these two do. I mean, it really feels like from the last few days – it, it, now that these guys are, I guess, released from from those contracts, it, it feels like they might be one of the people that are the, like unshackled and, and now, you know, allowed to creatively do as much as they initially wanted to do uh, and using that online audience to, to their full advantage. So do you think um, this will lead to anything between them and AEW? I, I, I wouldn't um, completely shut that door at all. I would imagine that these two, like to me, of the companies that they're going to work with, um, I would imagine Impact is going to be open to any options they want. And if Anderson and Gallows wanted the option to do New Japan, no problem. If they want some option that, hey, we can pop up on AEW, I don't think Impact would have any problem. If I was Impact right now and any of my talent were going to pop up on AEW, 
I would not be against that idea at all. Y- yeah. Would you, would you, now for AEW side, yeah, d- w- right. would they want to showcase these guys and not have an exclusive deal with them? That would be the question. Sure. And like when you do get into matches and, and booking, I mean, how much, how much do you give, uh, how much say do you give the impact at that point? Well, we have the prior example when Brian Cage was the Impact champion and they wanted to put him in the uh, the pre-show battle royal and Impact was not crazy about that idea, so it didn't happen. Today, I would look that Impact, like, listen, they, they need to create an awareness for themselves, so I would not be so rigid that if we had the option for two of our guys that can get on TNT and they're still with us, I, I wouldn't be dismissing that idea at all. I think Impact should be any exposure is a positive at this point, but I I think it's more. So the question is on uh, what does AEW get out of it? Um, Is there that incentive to put these guys on our TV? It's they're not our exclusive property and, and we're sharing them like, and does it limit how much we can use them? Like what, what's the incentive for us on a, such a, a tag team heavy promotion is, is there room for Anderson and Gallows to come in for a program? Right. Um, but yeah, it's I, I certainly don't dismiss it as a possibility uh, down the road. I, I, I have a question for you of the now that the 90 days are up, where do you feel it would be the best fit for Rusev? Um, like with anybody, I, I think um, my gut tells me if, you know, I think he would be good in AEW. I think anybody, honestly, would be good in AEW. Um, the question is, does AEW have room for him when they've, you know, when they're trying to build so many new people at the moment? The, um, the answer is no, but that does not stop them from signing guys. I don't yeah. think that, I don't think they're, and listen, Tony Khan, I mean, when he did the latest media rounds, I mean, as we talked about last week, you know, he's mentioned the fact that, th- that there is going to come a day when we are going to have to make some really tough decisions because there's, a lot of people we have under contract and they're paying all these guys too. So, I mean, credit to them for doing that during this pandemic. But, uh, you know, Tony Khan has flat out said like the, there will come a day that we have to kind of sit down and make some of these tough choices. And you're, you definitely are seeing, um, I mean, if you're AEW, how much they haven't really brought in a ton. Well, you know what? They brought in FTR. Like, do do you think they're at risk of, of of being? They brought in Matt Hardy. Do you feel like they're at, at risk of being seen as sort of like a company that is grabbing up WWE leftovers? I I think that that's to me. I I look at someone like a, a Rusev, and I look at okay, what can we do with him? I think that guy has enormous upside. He's got a personality that I think they only scratch the surface with in. WWE. So I take it as a case by case basis. I would not want to just look at eight of these guys that were released and sign them all up at once. Um, there's not the room for it. And I think you do run that risk of just being of, you know, recycling talent, even if you feel you have better ideas for these people to better utilize them like that is that's where they'll ultimately be judged upon is, you know, impact. They've brought in a bunch of guys. And in six months from now, if if Heath Slater is in a significant position and impact, then they're going to get credit for that. And if not, it's that's how he'll kind of be viewed that, you know, they took a guy that WWE gave up on and he just ended up in impact. Uh, so that's a balancing act with all of these performers of the names that, that were released. I mean, I, I definitely feel like he is probably the top name in, in terms of um, maybe status within the WWE. And if AEW is going to be taking a look at anybody uh, in terms of you know who is the biggest guy with the biggest star power that they can get from that re- list of releases, I would definitely think that they would be taking a look at Rusev. Um, but the big question is if they want to make that investment, if they you know I guess want to spend the money. Uh, I don't know how much Rusev makes, but I imagine it would probably be a bit more than a lot of the people that that they've signed. Um, and if that doesn't pan out, then I definitely see Impact uh, giving him a shot. I could I could see New Japan having some interest in him once they can bring foreigners uh, back over. Um, that would be interesting. I, it would be an unexpected move, but I, I'd definitely be interested. I could really see that guy having a lot of the appeal that Togi Makabe has to the Japanese audience, like just this th- this brute that has this personality attached to him. And I, I could certainly see Rusev um, figuring in very well in New Japan's picture. Can you see him wrestle at that pace? in that style though 
Um, it it would be, you know, it would it would certainly be it's a, a change right of now. pace. Yeah, it, it is. I I certainly don't discount it. I don't think he was probably allowed to go out and have that that style of match. But I I see him as somebody that is kind of in that that perfect mix of. He got a ton of exposure in WWE, but I think everyone looks at him as a missed opportunity by WWE instead of someone that fizzled out. I, I don't think he's viewed upon that at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Whereas others have to kind of overcome that stigma. Yeah. I think for people like him, even in EC3, I, I don't think they necessarily come with that with that same baggage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, it would be really interesting to see what move he makes and whether or not, like, you know, somebody like Aiden English might follow. Right. Yeah. Uh, he was another name in there. And I'm still waiting the week that Chris Hero shows up for this open challenge. So all those guys are free agents? Yeah. The NXT ones have been, they only had 30 days. So, right. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing, there hasn't been anything stopping them the last two months. Um, I, I just think Hero would just be such a great pick for that open challenge to show up. Um, for Cody. I, I, I could see many companies could be uh, greatly enhanced by bringing him in. Mm -hmm. A few more uh, notes here. This is a really unfortunate story with uh, Bobby Fulton. So Bobby Fulton had been battling throat cancer. And then recently he had announced that he was cancer free. And then on a Sunday, his son went on his Twitter account to announce, unfortunately, um, that his father had been hospitalized and the throat cancer had come back at a different part of his throat and he had to undergo surgery on Monday to stop um, uh, the inter uh, some internal bleeding. So he's out of surgery. Um, his, his son just said, you know, he was still in, in rough shape after the surgery, but he was out of it. So uh, we obviously wish our best to him, but that's just, that's a really, it, it's a really uh, tough diagnosis to get. And just, you know, to go through that, that mental um, yeah. cycle of, you know, hearing your cancer free and then so suddenly hearing it's back. I mean, that that's just, it's just really terrible news. Yeah, it really is. Um, and our, our uh, lay, let's, let's all wish for the best. Uh, SmackDown from Friday night, they finished with 1,912,000 viewers. So it was a bit of a bump from what the overnight figure was uh, once they had all of the the markets. So this was up slightly, up by 12,000 viewers from last week. Uh, they did a 0.5 in the demo. Um, this would still be the fourth lowest SmackDown number on Fox, and that was with the promotion of AJ Styles and Matt Riddle. And um, the pattern continues this week, where we got a pretty big promoted match on Raw. Uh, it's going to happen on SmackDown, where they're pushing the bar fight. And then next Monday on Raw, with the Asuka-Sasha Banks match. But I think it's interesting to look now that audiences are starting to realize like there's a big promoted match for all of these TV shows. Is that going to uh, change people's uh, viewing habits? And I, I think the bar fight's an interesting one. Is that going to be uh, a hook for people this Friday? Mm -hmm. They're certainly trying a lot, but you know, I'll say regardless of whatever ratings pattern shows up, I mean, it's made these shows better, you know, yes. having a main event to look forward to, has just made the experience better. And so regardless of whether or not it does well in the ratings, this is something they should keep. This is like, they should be treating every show like it's important. And you know, like there's something to, for, for a viewer to look forward to. So whether or not like it, it, it you know, it, it, it bears fruit in, in the ratings. I, I think they should keep it up. And the last note here, uh, MMA story. This was a uh, going around over the weekend after a uh, combate first reported it. Uh, and Ariel Hawani reporting that both sides have signed their bout agreements with UFC middleweight champion Israel Adesanya and Paulo Costa to fight September 19th at UFC 253. And Dana White was asked about this over the weekend. He had said, the fight's not done yet. The fight's not done. But yeah, that's the date we're targeting. And it looks like it is uh, it is all signed now for this to happen. And Dana White would indi indicated that this would be likely for Abu Dhabi, which is, you know, over the past week. Um, Dana White had stated they're they're very concerned about Nevada shutting down again and hoping that all of these cards in August uh, can happen in Nevada because he said, you know, Abu Dhabi is going to be their backup if if anything falls out and it seems that uh, Abu Dhabi is going to be their their home base for quite quite a while when it comes to international fights and maybe even more if they're facing the prospect of Nevada being shut down again and the UFC apex not being an option. But that is where everything is penciled in for August, which as we 
ran through. I mean, they have a lot of stuff slated for August with fight cards every Saturday, including the Daniel Cormier, Stipe Miocic fight and all of Dana White's contender series. So uh, it's probably an extremely stressful time in UFC. Yeah. Have you been keeping up with uh, many other sports that have reopened? Um, Just kind of... um kind of just the, the latest on a, a lot of the changes, especially with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, our government has given them the uh, the red light that they cannot uh, play out of Rogers Center. So now they're looking at, apparently they have five different candidates of where they're going to play. But just think of the logistical nightmare of you're planning this 60-game season. Suddenly your, vet, your stadium is not available, so they've got to find a new place. Uh, some of the options that they, they it sounds like Dunedin they do not want to go to because Florida and other options it could be a case where you're sharing a stadium with another team and just think about all of that from balancing out when teams are in town when they're not that you have to have two teams playing out of one stadium because uh, Major League Baseball they are not doing the bubble like we're seeing with the NHL with the NBA they're just running and everyone's traveling everywhere and it's like I've heard like arguments for and against that, but it seems that it is um, cer- certainly added risk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, can they, you know, with the size of a baseball stadium, is it feasible even to do the bubble? Well, the idea was that like with um, Rogers, Rogers Center here in Toronto, uh, that stadium is unique because it's got the, the hotel built inside of it. And that's mm-hmm. where the players were all going to be based out of. Uh, but the government, I mean, they're just, I, I don't think they're looking at it of, okay, will they be safe? Will they be not? It's just, you guys are going to be traveling to the U S and back. And for most countries right now, like they, they do not want to be relying on anything when it comes to the U S and their handling of, of the virus. Like there's not every state is equal, but there's enough concern that I think most countries are just like, we're, we're not dealing with anything, uh, that, the the U.S. has just done a terrible job with this in in general. I mean, as a citizen of the city that made the decision, I'm I'm actually happy to hear it. I, I think that you would probably echo a lot of people. Like if if you're a fan, there is no gain to the Toronto Blue Jays playing here versus playing in Pittsburgh. It's you're watching it on TV. It's not like you can go to these games. The economic benefit is minimal. It's like, what What do you as a citizen care where the Toronto Blue Jays are playing? So I, I would imagine a lot of people have the same um, opinion you do. Um, do. Do you foresee watching any baseball when it returns? Uh, just out of curiosity to see how they present it, you know, to see what the crowds look like, to see or, or lack thereof. Um, that that really is most of my interest. You? I listen. To, I'm definitely going to check out probably – uh, at least a game or two of all of these sports coming back. I'm so curious to see how they, uh, how they come off and just to compare them to what we've been watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, but man, the ideas that are being thrown out there, like I, I heard this show where they were, they were talking about like the technology you get in a Madden game where the crowd noise, it's, it's dependent on like what the action is like that's happening in the game. So they could have like fake crowd noise and stuff. Like it just seems like wow. every idea imaginable, throw it against the wall. And with that chaos, like that draws my curiosity in because it's it's a fresh canvas to try a lot of different things that under normal circumstances you would never entertain. What, what, and I, what, when are we going to get the first Major League Baseball cinematic match? That would be so awesome. Like you get a mixture of the Toronto Blue Jays, but set with like the backdrop of Major League. And oh, got, like, like Charlie that. Sheen coming in and Tom Berenger. Right. Okay. Uh, and then, I guess you'd have to use uh, Cleveland then. They play. They're playing in Anaheim, and it's like all of a sudden, like these dudes are flying. <laughs> the uh, yeah, you have um. <laughs> there's, a, there's a teenager like pitching in Chicago. Like what the hell? You could have the Lake of Reincarnation, and suddenly, uh, uh, Kelly Gruber emerges as number seventeen on the Toronto Blue Jays. You go back in time. I would watch every one of these things. Cinematic baseball. Yeah. Let's make it happen. All right. All of your news you can find up at postwrestling.com as you can all of our great shows. And we have several coming up this week. Starting off on Tuesday, 
Andrew Thompson is going to have an interview with Kelvin Tankman, who uh, is a regular with Game Changer Wrestling and has also recently signed with MLW. So you can look out for that interview. Tuesday night, we're dropping Rewind Away number 66. And our destiny is Pro Wrestling Noah's second and final Tokyo Dome show from July of 2005. Please tell me you've started this yet. It's a big show. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, I started this two weeks ago because well, it was well, daunting when I saw the length of this. And I knew I could not get through this I, in a weekend, especially this past weekend where we had all these pay-per-views. The way I watch wrestling, like I watch it and I forget about it if it's not like within the next, you know, 24 hours that I have to talk about it. So um, I, do, I do it to myself. Absolutely. But uh, it's a four hour show. Yes, not going to lie. But if you have any curiosity, I definitely recommend some of the bigger matches on this show. And namely... We have a classic, classic match between Kensuke Sasaki and Kenta Kobashi that I encourage everybody to go out and watch. We also have Mitsuharu Misawa taking on Toshiaki Kawada. For in, the last uh, time. For the last time, yeah. And in Pro Wrestling Noah, rekindling that 90s rivalry. Um, what else we got? Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Takeshi Rikio. Yeah, um, a very kind of odd match. This is when Tanahashi was the the under-30 champion on loan from New Japan. And this is when uh, Takeshi Rikio had... Beaten Kobashi, ended that legendary run in March, and is defending the title on the Tokyo Dome in what really is a mid-card match. There's also a GHC Junior Heavyweight title match that everyone has to see between Yoshinobu Kanemaru and Kenta. Yes, yes, prime Kenta. I mean, Kenta's great right now, but Noah Kenta was something special. Have you started the show? It's a big show. <laughs> Tune in, <laughs> Tune in oh my tomorrow. God. My God. Presented by Bruce Lord, uh, who we'll be talking to. Bruce Lord, uh, who is uh, responsible for Way's uh, Monday night, which I think we'll say slash Tuesday morning. Then on Wednesday, we've got Up Next and Rewinded Dynamite coming your way. On Thursday, the British Wrestling Experience is back. Uh, Martin Bushby will be hosting this solo, uh, and he's going to be joined by Sam West and Claire Warden from the Wrestling Resurgence Project. So uh, that should be a unique show coming up this Thursday. Friday, I've been granted a night off, and Wei Ting is going to be hosting Rewind to SmackDown Live. And who's going to be joining you this Friday? I have asked Kristen Ashley to come on to co-host Rewind to SmackDown with me. I'm really excited to do this show with Kristen. Uh, getting her thoughts on the current product. She's been a guest of ours previously on these shows, and uh, we've always enjoyed her opinions and thoughts. And now I thought it would be a great time uh, by giving John the night off to uh, get Kristen on to hear what she thinks of SmackDown. Hello? Oh, sorry. Oh. You cut out there, but we're back. We're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't have the night off yet, John. You know, not yet. Not yet. I was about to just take off here. Uh, but, and but, then the week. But that'll also be a live show. So you'll get a chance to call in if you're a patron and uh, listen to that one live. And the week rounds out Saturday with the return of the Rocky Maya via picture show. Nate Milton joined by Joey Lewandowski and Joe, Two, who have the most unique podcast out there uh, with Too Fast, Too Forever, where they review the Fast and the Furious franchise. They go through all the films, and then they just start over and over and over and over again, and they, it's an they, endless loop. They call them loop. laps. Laps, yes. Yeah. Uh, so they will be joining Nate to review 2013's Fast and Furious 6, starring Dwayne Johnson, Vin Diesel, and Paul Walker. Yeah, they, uh, they've they been guests on, on uh, uh, the Rocket My, My Via Picture Show before, but... Um... I've I've yet to hear too too fast too forever, but it is a concept that is so incredibly intriguing because what does lap six sound like? <laughs> what what like what more insight can you gain from a sixth viewing of a particular film? Uh, I'm sure there's something. I'm sure there's plenty, but like, wh what does that sound like in podcast form? So uh, I. I don't know what lap this will be for them uh, with with uh, Nate on the Rocky My Via Picture Show, but I, I imagine it would it would probably be a few. Uh, just quickly before we move on with with the show, I wanted to make mention on Thursday I will be a guest on the Up Next Patreon. Uh, those guys have just been putting in so much shows, and up there right now you can even find Davy's uh, 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 horror show post show that he did with a, a slew of guests that I listened to and, and I was very entertained and also very interested 
with with uh, John Ceno, Stephanie Chase, and MJ from NJ appeared on that show, as well as their watch, watch along. So, uh, and then on Thursday, I will be on their Patreon talking about Freddie got fingered. And if you <laughs> thought my my defense of some of the stuff that took place on the horror show was infuriating or maddening, or that man, this way things gone crazy, you have no idea. Until you've heard me talk about Freddy Got Fingered, a movie I I snuck in to see when I was probably like, I don't know, 15. This is like an R-rated movie. Uh, so I, I've yet to see the movie since that period. So this will be my first time watching it as an adult. Um, and I'm sure I'll have plenty of thoughts on a very controversial film. I was working at a movie theater when this film came out. And this was when I had to be the obnoxious guy that would have to come up onto the stage before every movie and introduce it. And do what? they had that this? Yes, this was something that famous players would do, at least at our theater. It, it, they did these at, at most Silver City theaters and I would have to come up and it's pretty much like doing they would leave it to be just do whatever. And we would just kind of turn it into like doing essentially like three minutes of like just like stand up no. or we do like <laughs> skits with the with each other, like our friends. Oh my and we God. would just have so much fun building this thing up as like so tongue in cheek like the the Oscar nominated Freddy Got Fingered is coming up <laughs> next starring PhD Tom Green and his band of cohorts I can't remember what I said this was a long time ago this was what 2000 2001 that is like was, you know this was after road trip right uh it was yes yes that is like the perfect superhero origin story for John Pollock. Like now I know so much makes sense. You know how you're such a great performer, uh, on, you know, on TV, on a podcast, how you're so quick witted. It must have all stemmed from <laughs> introducing movies like Freddy Got Fingered to an audience. That's probably where it all came from. And uh, this was 2001. So think of some of the gems I got to introduce there. This was the year of, of glitter. It's oh, the year Freddy Got wow. Fingered. Um, not too long after that, it was Crossroads starring Britney Spears. Oh man. I, I mean, wish I could see all these, like not, not the films, but your introduction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Usually I, I would, I would just play it up too, because usually you'd get up there and some people would just start to boo you because they don't want to hear from <laughs> you. They want to get to the movie. So I, I would just have fun with it. you like, Oh uh, goodness. Anyway. One last thing to promote, of course, uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, as many of you will be listening to this, is the last day to get your Marvel-themed post-wrestling t-shirts. And, uh, well, your last chance to get it because all profits, uh, so that all profits will be directed to both the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund as well as the, I, might, I must have screwed these names up, but uh, the CLLDF's uh, Retailer uh uh, uh as assistance program for covid relief for canadian comic book shops so uh it's your last day to to get those orders in uh before we tally up the profits you can still get the shirt afterwards but if you want to donate to those two specific causes uh today's your last day and it de and the delivery is super quick as john solo 76 will attest to on instagram who received his shirt. We have our friends in the U.S. at uh, Reverie Apparel to thank for that. Uh, we've had some COVID-related delays with our usual suppliers in the U.S. So uh, Patrick, our man at Reverie, like was kind enough to reach out, heard me talk about it on our prior show, and was like, "Hey, I run a print shop. I can send these for out for you in the U.S." Oh, made that's the, amazing. Made the deal. It was awesome. We have like an incredible network of uh, of listeners. So uh, thank Patrick at, at Reverie Apparel for that. Thank you to Patrick, and thank you to all of you that have uh, helped support these uh, two very, very worthy uh, funds that we're uh, donating to. So there you go, store.postwrestling.com, uh, with the proceeds uh, going to those two funds uh, through the end of Tuesday, uh, whatever sales we make. So let's go on over to Raw that was taped today at the Performance Center. Uh, notable absences uh, from tonight's show, uh, no Austin Theory. Billy Kay was not there. Uh, Apollo Crews was not back. Nia Jax, Liv Morgan, Lana, and no Kevin Owens tonight. No Kevin Owens, you're right. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so he was at the pay-per-view yesterday, but nothing today. Yeah, so again, like we can't say, you know, what the reasons were. Um, just these were the people that we did not see on TV tonight. It might have just been him not getting booked. I mean, that's... Like that is, you know, a very realistic 
possibility of, mm-hmm. you know, people that are ready, but they may just not have a storyline. I mean, Shayna Baszler was an example of that. Like she was, it's not like she was hurt all this time. It was like, they just did not have an idea for her. And she was on the main well, event. Yeah. Like who was Owens attached to? He was attached to Ray Mysterio. And now Mysterio is kind of in this, uh, this, this kind of angle right now. So there may not have been anything for him. So I don't know what the reason was. Uh, what have you heard about Apollo Crews? Apollo Crews? I mean, I, I, I don't know what the specific issue is. Um, it's been, you know, speculated upon. I mean, he hasn't been on TV for multiple weeks, but I, I can't say for sure if it is uh, COVID related. Okay. Um, Rollins and Murphy uh, come out at the beginning and Philip says that the optic nerve was not severed and it's expected Ray will be able to maintain his vision and make f- a full recovery, which hmm. I think you could decode as um, he contract talks like- are going really well, if not are done. <laughs> he signed the contract to have his uh, eyeball reattached. Wow, this, uh, th- uh, this is remarkable to happen in 24 hours time. Well, you stick that eyeball in. I mean, you check the optic nerve and... He literally was holding this eyeball. I mean, I almost wish they did not even bother to show the eyeball. It was like that that really took it to a different level. Um, They did promise the eyeball. There there are a lot of people actually criticizing the match for not showing like the proper like full eyeball getting ripped out. Well, it's uh, uh, those were the details that they did promise. So it looks like the recovery is being... uh, He's on the road to recovery, but no Ray on tonight's show. Rollins teaches us about globe luxation. He understood what the match entailed, and the visual of Ray with his eye in his hand is going to stick with him forever. It made me sick to my stomach, both literally and figuratively. Oh, yeah. What is What does it mean to be figuratively sick to your so- stomach? Like, it's it's kind of literal or it's not, isn't it? Well, no, not not really. I mean, figuratively, being sick to your stomach is just like the feeling of, I guess, like feeling so sick deep down in your body that it feels like it's in your stomach. Literally being sick in your stomach, I guess, would be what he did last night. Well, he was literally sick to his stomach. Um, I don't know if we mentioned that in the notes, but there was a spot where he vomited after the match, uh, which they replayed here in case you missed it. Oh, they repl- did they replay the, the vomit? Uh, off the t- it wasn't during the it was uh the video right at the start of raw um oh, where wow. they were going over the highlights of the eye for an eye match usually and they, they make you pay to see that they did give away the vomit wow so then rollins blames the audience for making him the monday night messiah and you know, they have always kind of like danced around this this character that this is my response to all you assholes booing me last year. But this seemed to be the most overt. Like this character, this garbage I'm treading through, it's on you. I tried to be a baby face last year and all of you assholes wanted this. So this is what you've got. The Monday Night Messiah. And I've got a million of these promos for the, <laughs> for the end of time coming your way and i am going to enunciate every single syllable that is an interesting way of interpreting it like he is he's basically being like um uh meta meta referential here <laughs> I, th- I thought it was like the most overt during this promo but it's it's always kind of been there he said that ray is the one who asked for this match and actions have consequences it is hard to argue with the man ray did choose this oh yeah like, he was not goaded into this. He was not pressured into this. Uh, and I think that that does somehow, like, uh, change the dynamic a little bit. But it's, uh, you're still supposed to hate this man. Of course. Yeah. He says, you can't dwell in the past. Ray is out of sight. And now Raw can meet its full potential. Well, no one is left. The defense is that, you know, like, Ray initiated the match out of revenge for Rollins attacking his eye. So when Aleister Black comes out here demanding, you know, vengeance, he blames Rollins for starting it all. Yes, he comes out. Don't you dare deflect any of this blame on anyone but yourself. And he is here to rectify all of this. So he attacks Murphy. Murphy just keeps coming at him. And 
He confronts Rollins, but then Murphy comes back again, yanks him to the floor, and we go to break and come back with Seth Rollins versus Aleister Black. But uh, yes, starting the show off with all of the fallout of the eye for the eye for an eye match. Uh, what did you think about this as the uh, follow up to Sunday night? You know, uh, perhaps it was because Rollins this week was speaking about something that I had just seen, like a literal event I can actually picture very well in my head, rather than trying to perhaps deliver like a vague, you know, metaphorical message about like, man, uh, uh, you know, uh, disciples and all, all that shit. Like I got into Rollins promo this week. It felt like an appropriate response to him, you know, do, uh, taking part in the, in the regretful act of taking his opponent's eyeball out and using heel logic to blame the audience for it. I, I enjoyed that. Rollins and black had their match. Uh, black misses Rollins punching the post and then black uh, started to have his arm worked over. And this became the whole focus of the match. He would come back, miss the Cabrata, then Rollins missed the stomp. So Black starts nailing the Black Mass. Murphy runs in. He eats one. And this sets up the commercial break. They come back. And now Black has lifted Rollins uh, by the foot, goes for the Black Mass, but it stopped with a roll up. And then Rollins comes back with a series of super kicks. Rollins, or, or sorry, Murphy is still selling the Black Mass down on the floor. And Rollins snaps the arm of Black on the top rope. Springboard knee gets stopped, and then he hits an arm ringer and stomps Black, and there's this delayed cover, and then he rolls over to pin Aleister Black in 12 minutes, um, and then we would get into the the post-match beatdown here. I thought this was a really, really good match between these two. I thought they told a great story with Black's arm. Seth's offense was great here, focusing on the arm, but doing it in a way that I think showed off how varied his moveset is. And without really making a lot of that work seem, you know, too contrived anytime somebody has to work, uh, like target a body part. Great comebacks from both guys throughout. Really good, exciting pace in like 15 minutes or so. I like the match. I'm just disappointed that Aleister Black is being positioned as, you know, essentially Ray's sidekick who tried to get revenge for his friend, but even failed at doing that. When Black came out here, I thought this was going to be Seth's, you know, next big program, whether it be for SummerSlam or at least, I don't know, like a big edition of Raw. But instead, it was like a match that was, uh, man, put out here uh, with zero anticipation, essentially a throwaway TV match just to further, you know, bolster Seth's position. I mean, this is a spot that that could have been reserved for, uh, uh, man, what's that guy's name? Uh, Dale, Dale Gass. What's what's that? Humberto Carrillo. <laughs> oh, Humberto. Because he's got a shirt that says Dale Gas. Um, yeah, like, I, you know, like, and it, it, to me, like, this type of booking tells me that, oh, man, I don't know if they really see Aleister Black as that, you know, next big star that they really need to protect. I mean, not only did they have him go, like, have Rollins go over clean here, but Rollins even, like, did the delayed cover. Like, he did the stomp, paused, still got the one, two, three. The, the Triple H Booker T. Special from WrestleMania yeah. 19. Mm -hmm. Take your what, time. What did you think it, of it? I, I, it was it was a fine match. Um, I, I think these two work work very well together. They're great talents. Um, afterwards, um, there was more attention. I think for for the post match here to really get this uh, this maniacal Seth Rollins across and make us forget that this man vomited 24 hours ago. He attacks Black with Murphy's assistance. And he sent into the barricade, the plexiglass. They wrap his arm around the post. Black's got to be screaming in pain. And they drive the arm into the floor. Rollins then screams, when is enough enough? Aha, when is enough enough? And he asks, who is here to save you? And he stomps Aleister Black's arm. And I started to envision Aleister Black retreating to the room and we've got SummerSlam coming up in just a couple of weeks and Seth <laughs> I am coming and I am going to be armed but you will not be after SummerSlam because I am going to rip your arm off arm for his arm arm for an arm match yeah yes. absolutely it's only logical progression for this feud right yeah yeah um what's the term What's what's the global luxation version of uh, having your arm severed? Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe the uh, 
that that's going to take some uh that's going to take a lot of um uh, a specialist to say the least uh that can re- repair the arm it doesn't just grow back overnight well glad to see them moving uh down the body you know start with the eye down uh get the arm next yeah maybe the liver next R- Rollins opponents are going to look like Mr. Potato Head they're just going to be losing everything they're just going to be like a round body man Oh yeah, like a mut- like the mutilator, like a uh, mace and the mutilator. Wait. There you go, McFoley. Yeah. Well, um, you know they continue building Seth here really strong as like the top heel of this brand, I guess, next to Randy Orton. But I would even say Seth, like with really strong win over Ray uh, last night and a strong win over Alistair Black here, is definitely like ascending to that top heel position. And uh, certain people might disagree, but I think they've done a good job. I could have used just some reason for Kevin Owens not being in the building because that was kind of this glaring hole that you're all out of friends. And, you know, Kevin Owens was very much attached to this. And he just beat Rollins last week that I think that his presence kind of like was this this shadow over this. Like, where's where's Kevin Owens to come to the rescue? And that could have just been explained with um, any kind of reason why he's he's not here tonight. Hmm. Then we had a recap of MVP from the night prior, naming himself the United States champion. Tom Phillips said over and over that Apollo Crews is still the champion. And MVP and Bobby Lashley are in the back with Ron Simmons. And he says that there is a better way. And he took off. So we saw, we, we had a few appearances from Ron Simmons, but it never was like, Perhaps next week's episode, he's going to have something more uh, substantive because you were obviously taping two shows. This seemed like uh, quite a lot to bring this guy in for two backstage segments. But yeah, kind of having him in kind of this leadership role for MVP and and Bobby Lashley is kind of how it felt like. Does Simmons have a backstage role? No, no. So just like like brought in here... I mean, either by request or because of, of convenience, I'm not really sure, but um, I, I'm i definitely interested. He's not just here doing the cameo saying, damn, you know, it seems like there's something in the work specifically for a legend, you know, mentor type of role. Yes. And then R-Truth walked in, and he's got a frying pan, which is never explained, and he compliments MVP on his replica belt. He says, this is the real thing. Cruz says, got a frying pan. You're right. It was not explained. No. Uh, <laughs> look, what do you have a frying pan? It just seemed to be maybe he was off cooking something. He says, Cruz is the real champion, and they invite R Truth to come to the ring with them. And R Truth says, No, I don't want to be put in Nelson from The Simpsons again. And there is a hidden referee, and Shelton Benjamin super kicks R Truth and defeats R Truth to become the new 24 7 champion. Yeah, yeah. This was, I, I guess, their way of introducing Shelton as part of uh, MVP Stable, the Hurt Business, and I guess giving him a belt to make him feel like a special part of the group. I mean, I just hope um, this 24-7 run isn't like the other 24-7 runs, because if, if the idea is to make Shelton look like a threat, having him lose again to R-Truth in quick schoolboy fashion uh, will quickly diminish uh, his importance. Can I also say that during this backstage segment, and we can include Ron Simmons here, this was the most deceptively old segment of people that look a lot younger than their ages. We have Simmons, 62, R-Truth, 48, MVP, 46, Lashley, 44, and Shelton Benjamin, 45. The youngest person in this segment was 44-year-old Bobby Lashley. Black don't crack. I mean, these... uh, these ages are like stunning when you when you look at them. Um, so outcome MVP Lashley and Benjamin, and it was made pretty clear here that Benjamin is now part of the Hurt business. And I like they, the name. Yeah, they're they're clearly like going with with that and have, have been utilizing it. And this seems to be the sign of this stable that MVP is creating and maybe having. Uh, some involvement with with Ron Simmons or doing something. I I imagine we're getting some kind of angle with him next week. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I'm I'm happy to see the stable fleshed out. I mean, of course, MVP's been doing a great job with Lashley, but I mean, 
the man has been so good as a nucleus for for you to to, to build heels around baby faces around that I think extending it to include somebody like Shelton is something I'm really happy to see for Shelton Benjamin, who man has like really not been given like a big role at all during this entire WWE run. So not to say that this will be, I mean, he is competing for the, tw- like he's the 24 seven champion here, but I, I love, I like the stable. It's, it's certainly the return of the beatdown clan. Uh, and I'm just happy to see like a proper stable with a proper name, you know, how I, we don't get that too often anymore. MVP is in the ring and refers to Ricochet and Seti as dumb and dumber. And they don't listen. They continue to run down Apollo Crews and then Ricochet and Cedric Alexander come out. And Alexander says, dumb and dumber. That was funny back in 2006 when your career was relevant. And then you had Ricochet like go, ooh, like do one of those. <laughs> Boy. Ooh. Um, um, I mean, Dumb and Dumber came out in 1994. I don't know if like there were zingers related to that movie 12 years later. And God knows there was nothing funny about Dumb and Dumber-er. Oh, man. Have you seen that Bob Saget scene? No. I, oh, I never man. saw the sequel. I didn't, I didn't want to see it. I, 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 like, I, I, yeah, I don't know if it's a, it's a really good movie or not, but that Bob Saget scene. Really I haven't funny. seen it. Okay, well, there you go. Maybe maybe that can be an Easter egg on your Freddy Got Fingered review. <laughs> Way goes to oh, the movies. Goodness. That'll be the next year. <laughs> then, um, you know, sometimes we have uh, parents listening to these shows, and I, I will say something inappropriate, and children, I don't want, uh, I want you to shield your, your ears. Because Cedric said, MVP, you're not a champ. You're a chump. I think Ricochet said it, but um, nonetheless, uh, equally as scathing. This is where we needed, like, the air horn response. Yeah, yeah, or something. This is um, a zing. Well, uh, I don't know. It's a PG-rated show. Really? <laughs> Last night? They're a PG-rated well, the show? The, the pay-per-views aren't. No, no doubt. Like if these guys had free reign and were able to speak as themselves, you would get a far different uh, type of story um, and far different type of interaction. Uh, but, you know, that said, I, I, I thought actually Cedric and Ricochet sounded decent here. You know, they had a simple message, got a bit of personality out there, and uh, I thought sounded natural overall, as natural as you could on a scripted uh, PG rated show. Shelton, they said, is the new executive in the Hurt Business and calls them two little kids that should be sitting in catering and offers to go pick two, uh, go pick a partner – or sorry, pick two of us uh, to take on you. But they say, we don't need to. We have a friend with us. And out comes Mustafa Ali making his Raw debut. And The hacker. They, the hacker's the, back. Yeah, he's hacked the, uh, the, the brand split because – there was no explanation of this, why he was on Raw. He's just on Raw. Cool. We'll take it. I mean, free agent. He's been off. Like, was he even ever a sta- an established part of SmackDown? Yes, he was. He was? He was on SmackDown, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so we got a... Uh, they cleared the ring here, and then they did, like, the superhero triple pose. I thought this was really cool. You know, like, when, when I see all the chess piece- pieces here on the board here between these six guys... I realize that I'm a fan of, like, almost every single guy here. And then they bring in, like, one of my favorites to join them in Mustafa Ali. Um, I know they've been building that hacker thing for weeks, but I'm glad they've abandoned it. I feel like this is a feud with the Hurt Business that seems more serious and seems like a better environment to bring a talent like Mustafa Ali in. He can be a featured star. And the combination of these guys in matches, like, will be all awesome. Like, I could see Ali in the mix with any of these heels to see him team up with Cedric, Ricochet, or Apollo. All those potentials I'm pretty excited for. So we got a six-man, and they worked on Alexander in the corner. Lashley speared him in the corner, and then MVP hit a running boot into the corner, which is not the Haluva kick. Instead, Tom called it a hell of a boot. Oh, I didn't notice. <laughs> then we got the, the ball and elbow. Tag is made to Cedric. 
Uh, later, Ali came in. They sent them to the floor, went through the commercial break. They had the heat on Ricochet. Then Lashley gets sent to the floor. He catches Ricochet and Alexander, but it's Ali that takes them down with a suicide dive, sending him into the desk. Benjamin boots Ali. There's a moonsault onto Benjamin, and it's left with MVP and Ali, with MVP missing the hell of a boot and hits is hit with a neck breaker, 450 splash, and Ali pins MVP in 1457. Really fun six man tag here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I enjoyed it. You know, this wasn't a must see match, but I think it absolutely did its job of establishing the new storyline between the Hurt Business and this you know new faction uh, consisting of, of a returning Ali with uh, Cedric and, and Ricochet, and it looks like they're setting Ali up for a potential U.S. title shot. It almost felt like Ali was coming in here to play Apollo Crews, to take Ooh. his role. Yeah, perhaps. Well, I mean, what would the result have been last night? I mean, I would assume it was just Cruz was going to win and then they were going to move on. And I mean, there's there's nothing to suggest that Cruz is going to be gone uh, a long time. So, I mean, this may just be temporary. But I mean, the way this comes out, like you have to do a U.S. title match now with Ali. You do, yeah. And the question is, do you have Ali win? Because the guy is returning from a long layoff, and to have him just lose, I think would be really disappointing. I mean, I, I really liked seeing Ali team up with Cedric and Ricochet here. The three of them are awesome. Um, the only question is if they'll continue to book Ali strong, or he'll if he'll get the cruiserweight treatment like they've given Cedric and Ricochet for so many weeks. And they probably, they can't probably know for sure with with Apollo because you know if you're going to do that US title match I would think you do it next week I don't think you hold it off any longer than that and mm. then they would have done it on Monday and we got to wait 2 weeks and I'm I'm sure they're hopeful that Apollo is going to be there but I think they were hopeful he was going to be ready for Sunday like he was out doing media and stuff promoting the match so I I don't think they were all that concerned that he wouldn't be ready but he wasn't so yeah, I would be really yeah. disappointed if Ali was just brought in here as sort of like a like a surrogate role, and then like after a week, he's just like kind of a placeholder for for Cruz before Cruz re- resumes the the program. Because, um, man, well, guy- I mean, he he was moved to the Raw roster a little bit ago. It wasn't just done for for this. So I think he was going to be on Raw regardless, and maybe they just felt this was a hole to fill. Um. And you can do a TV match with MVP and uh, Ali, and MVP leaves with the title somehow, and you still are on track for Cruz. But mm-hmm. um, I'm glad to see Ali's back on TV. And, you know, him, Cedric, and Ricochet, like, they could have some great six-mans together, and I, I like the six-man. As a mid-card program, I'm really interested in, like, what's going on here. I feel like it's really healthy. And, and again, it's all being built around MVP and the Hurt Business. I think Lashley is looking tremendous in all these matches because he's the lone giant throwing all of these cruiserweights around. And it makes him look just fantastic. And, um, you know, booking aside, I think Cedric and Ricochet have been really great in ring. uh, And the the tandem with Ali, I think, will just really open up like some really great matches. Randy Orton was in the back and did a promo about the moments that change your life. And people might think that those moments to him would be joining Evolution beating Mick Foley, or becoming the youngest world champion where I headlined SummerSlam all by myself and pinned uh, an imaginary thought to become the world champion. But those aren't the moments he's referring to. Instead, the moment that comes to mind for him is 175 days ago when he swung a chair down on Edge's surgically repaired neck and how his friendships with Edge, Christian, and Big Show, men who once helped him save him from himself, are all destroyed. And that moment brought pain to so many, yet it gave me satisfaction. I ended his career. I ruined Christian's chance at another match. And tonight, I'm going to punt, kick Big Show and end his career. What yeah. an awful human being. Uh, Yeah, he's pretty bad. Yeah, he's not a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's, but a good uh, promo. Yeah. I like the intensity in this promo a lot, you know. Um. Far from like a, you know, like the best type of Orton promo we've seen lately, but still like leagues above, I think, the standard. Yeah, uh, I I thought we got really good promos from both guys Mm -hmm. uh, ahead of this main event. Uh, They heavily promoted the bar fight for SmackDown on Friday. Then we saw Ron Simmons chatting with the Viking Raiders. That was it. Um, I'd love to know what they were chatting about. I mean, maybe they're going to do something where Simmons is kind of uh, 
offering his guidance, and then he's going to be attached to a certain team. The Viking Raiders? I wouldn't put them with the Viking Raiders. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Imagine them in the car together doing karaoke. You know, like, Farouk kind of came in with, like, like Viking type of headgear. Um, Remember? Oh, yeah. Farouk Assad. Yeah. Okay. So if he had the headgear, I think he would make a pretty interesting... Passes down the helmet, uh, and the Viking Raiders take on a baby blue and black motif. Sure. He was essentially like a space Viking at the time. Could be. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting what, whatever they have, uh, if they have an idea for, for Simmons. This was kind of just... Uh, there's really no context to this with the Viking Raiders, other than uh, they were here. Um, we, we could say that later on in the show, they came out to help, uh, who did they, they took out, uh, Andrade and Garza. Yeah. So maybe, maybe he was giving them some pointers on how to do a run-in. <laughs> you run out, <laughs> <laughs> you w- walk up the steps and then you open the curtain, <laughs> you take one foot forward and you do it fast and you do it right before a commercial break. <laughs> For maximum impact. Uh, they did a whole retrospective look at the Big Show's career, gearing him up. This was, uh, you came out as if thinking, oh no, there's doom coming this man's way. Did it document like his 20 turns? Um, they went, they, they, they got through maybe, um, uh, the first two chapters of the very long book. That's turns. like the, that's the, man, like, I don't know. That's a YouTube Chronicle. video WWE should really put together. Oh, like, yeah. it would be hilarious. Yeah. If yeah. they just put, like, it would seriously be like an hour long video if you just put the actual turns back to back. Christian joins them by Skype, or sorry, by satellite. He says that Randy Orton is one of the best to ever do this. Uh, he knew what he was getting himself into, but Orton used Ric Flair against him. He will never look at Randy Orton or Ric Flair the same. And Christian says, I might never be the same again. And then Joe is asking him how he's doing. He says, Joe, some days are better than others. But I'll be honest, I don't feel good. And I'd do it all over again if it meant Randy Orton got what was coming to him. And Big Show has a lot of people in his corner. And Big Show is going to be ready for the traps that Randy Orton tries to set. And he's hoping Big Show knocks Randy Orton out cold. So poor Christian here. This guy was miserable and mm-hmm. um, did not get what he was hoping for in this main event. But in terms of doing a doing a Zoom interview to sell uh, a concussion from a kick to the head, I would say Christian pretty much nailed it here. Like this guy came across like a dude who was totally messed up. Totally agree. I thought I thought his performance was really strong here. He's a man who's still very visibly emotionally scarred by Orton's attack, and he needed to like be convincing in this role because it adds weight to what big show was about to fight against. Cause if show loss, he would essentially kind of be in the same like depressed catatonic state that Christian is in right now. Sarah Schreiber interviewed Bianca Belair. She described her, her, her rise in the division is going to be the fastest. And then Peyton Royce cuts her off, sends Schreiber away and calls Bianca Belair the dumbest. Mm-hmm. Ruby comes in and they are going to totally overuse that EST gimmick in these I, promos. You know, I'll let them I'll let them do it for maybe like 3 weeks, but then after that like just to establish it of course, but yeah, like it, you can certainly run the risk of uh overexposing it. Ruby enters and this is where we learn Billy K is not here. So she was uh, notably absent here and Peyton Royce says that Ruby should just forfeit their match tonight. And Belair should do some more thinking instead of talking so she doesn't end up like that trash Liv Morgan. Yeah, and uh, in reaction to that, Ruby was like, got really angry and said, don't, you know, say her name again. Say it like, you know, I dare you to. So they are still continuing to remind us of Liv Morgan and her attachment to Ruby here. uh, So we can expect some sort of continuation of that story. Peyton Royce and Ruby Riot, they had a short match. Um, Royce has just introduced all of these kicks to her repertoire. Uh, She tells Ruby, Liv Morgan can't stand you. And then she ties Ruby's arm behind her back while they're in the ropes. 
Uh, there's this jumping high kick. Then Royce misses coming off the top and gets hit with the riot kick. Ruby wins, and she sells this like she has just uh, main evented WrestleMania and won the title. Like the look on her face, like she was shocked that she pulled this off. She beat Peyton Royce, and she was holding her neck afterwards. The the reaction I thought was performed really well. Um, but I, man, like I, I mean, it, it, this was supposed to be a big deal for Ruby, of course, because she's lost like twice to the iconics and separate occasions and singles matches so this was like a big stumbling block block for her i suppose i didn't really put together like what she actually changed about herself how she grew in order to like get over the hump to get this victory was it simply because billy wasn't here that allowed her to do this or or was it the association with bel-air uh like what are we supposed to know about ruby that like what changed about ruby in order for her to grow to get this yeah she had the numbers advantage this week um and she pretty much got beaten up for the whole match she just hit the riot kick so maybe she was trying too hard just got to hit one move one kick that's it okay Overexerting herself too much andrade and garza were with vega i swear that charlie has interviewed these three and it's been the exact same interview for i don't know how many weeks oh yeah yeah well she's guys saying- are you on the same page <laughs> this has been her lead-in question every single week, and Vega comes back with the same exact response every week, and out of nowhere, the Street Profits jump them, and Gar- this is right as Garza's flirting with, with Charles, and the Profits uh, just nail them, and I kind of like this with the Street Profits. Like, it, it gave them, like, a bit more of a serious edge to them, um, mm-hmm. and then we got our non-title match coming up next. Yeah. Yeah, I like the two. NXT this week, we've got Donovan Dijakovic and Karrion Cross, as well as William Regal's huge, huge, huge announcement. Oh, you know how we love announcements. Announcements. They love them. Oh, what did you think of uh, 50 plus for 50? Oh, we've skipped over that on, on being the elite. So Matt Jackson and Nick have started a new segment where they are frustrated that they can't capture the over 50 demographic. (laughs) So they have been, they're trying to brainstorm and saying, (laughs) it's like, it was like the best shot at NXT without being so overt. It was like, it it was a shot at NXT, but it was as much a shot about like all the stupid speculation and and hysteria that takes place online. It is. And they were like, what would our grandparents want to watch on our show? (laughs) And I just thought it was so funny. So we got 50 seconds of Matt Jackson doing his gardening. And it was (laughs) 50 plus seconds for over 50. Oh, man. Like, I'm I'm not over 50. I'm far from it. Yes. But I I was like, man, he had this contraption that like, (laughs) you sprinkle the water on top and it just like drips all the way down to the bottom and, and like in this whole tower of pots it's it's you can have a giant essentially like tree by the end of it uh it was great he showed off his like what is it uh tomato trees his apple trees cool when i said i watched being the elite this week i i fast forward through through quite a lot of it what i what? did make I can't there sit down you. for thirty minutes to watch this, even increasing the I, speed. I do, uh, I do watch it at, at increased speeds. Yeah, I do, I do skip through a lot. It, it's like, man, it's thirty minutes. It's it is a, a bit of a commitment, but but I, uh, yeah. per, per your recommendation, I stopped on the Dark Order bit. Brody Lee is great in these because they're allowed to cuss. It's it's the greatest. Like I am not a big fan of swearing because sometimes it it just feels so. You've got to be able to have that delivery that makes it sound cool. And Brody Lee mm-hmm. staring down at these guys and say, I've got an eight-year-old that isn't a big fuck-up, but this guy's a fuck-up. It's great. I think Brody Lee is fantastic. Um, and maybe this is his, his lot in AEW is being uncensored on being the elite. And maybe we do these on pay-per-views. Yeah, I mean, you know, not to even say, like, cussing is the big difference maker. The difference maker is them taking this overly serious Dark Order gimmick and putting it under, you know, the sort of, like, campy, slapsticky veil of being the lead in order to take it, like, in a comedic direction that I think works so much better. It's not taking the cult thing so seriously. It is 
like taking it seriously but in a funny way that yeah might kind of detract from like them being seen as all you know a serious threatening faction but i don't take them seriously i don't take them seriously i don't take them seriously anyway it gets them over i mean you know like you look at uh what is it inner circle okay they do plenty of comedy but when it's time to to get serious they can still get serious right now the dark order is in danger of people not giving a shit about them at all but if you uh, like, I I I make an effort to watch them on being the elite, partic- in particular Bro- Brody Lee, who uh, is just fantastic as like the boss, and John Silver, Alex Reynolds as the two fuck ups who are trying to constantly fail, fail, and failing to do so, recruit people to the Dark Order by getting them to drink um, a literal can of powdered Kool Aid and trying to get them to join their group where they will watch, promise to watch uh, Fast and Furious movies on a loop. Um, I don't know how many laps, but uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't think that they're uh, unaware that it's been su- it's been successful and talked about on YouTube. Like, it, I feel like you know, one of the skits, Brandon, uh, what's his name, Brandon Cutler said, like Dark Order, like the hottest thing on BTE right now. Anyway, so I have to imagine they're thinking of ways of implementing this version, or at least elements of this version of the Dark Order to TV. Uh, so the Street Profits against Andrade and Garza, non-title match. Um, this, I-, I thought, like, Montez Ford really got the shine here. Like, when he got the tag, and some of his vertical leaps were just incredible. And mm-hmm. then he finished it with a Tope Con Hero onto Andrade on the floor that set up the first break. Um, after the- Afterward, um, there's a heat on Ford. Uh, Dawkins gets the hot tag. Later on, Ford gets crotched on the top turnbuckle, and as Garza goes for the superplex, it's blocked, and Garza gets knocked down. Ford hits the most incredible from the heavens uh, to pin Garza. So interesting here that the champions go over in the non-title match, but the highlight of this match was the slow-motion replay where they froze the frame as Ford hit his peak on this from the heavens Dude, this guy was so high up. It was insane how high up he was. Yeah, it's breathtaking every time. Like, man, sometimes it's like it's so hard to put your own variation on like a move that's pretty commonly used, like a like a frog splash. But um, this guy, I would it. I would never do a frog splash if I was on the same show as this guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who do you have that does it? Sasha, uh, Ray. That's quite a few. Owens does it. Um, right. No, nothing like this one. This was just uh, it was it was incredible. Like a good match. Um, I like they're obviously pushing Andrade and Garza, but they've got a really strange way about doing it, where they lose to Big Show, uh, they lose in this non-title match, but they're clearly in the mix, and I'm expecting they somehow get to a title match out of this. You think so? Because I thought I I felt like this was like I don't honestly know what this was because um. It felt like they were in line, and then this just kind of extinguished whatever momentum they had coming off of the the beat. They're pairing these guys with like Randy Orton, like they're getting involved in like the biggest segment on on the show. It's it was just very strange booking that they lost. Like no controversy, no need for a rematch. It was, um, yeah, I was just surprised. Uh, like after last night, I'm not complaining about clean finishes, but just uh, at the same time, uh, I don't know how you turn this around to a title uh, unless they just do it. Let's just say, yeah, title match. Oh, God. Yeah, I don't know. And I can't really tell you that I have that much interest either. Well, Vega was upset at them, but they weren't. Vega said that you guys blew it, and now I've got to fix it. And Garza says, we're on the same page. And Vega tells them to prove it. Bailey and Sasha come out, and Sasha's got the Raw women's title. Banks says, I fought for this title, unlike Asuka, who was handed this by Becky Lynch, who has gone on maternity leave. Oscar nearly blinded the referee, and Bailey borrowed the referee's shirt to officiate her match, and now they have all the gold. Oscar and Kyrie Singh come out. Oscar cuts a fiery promo, and then Stephanie McMahon, who I don't know what rank she holds on this show, but she's got power. Um, she is like the, the still the de facto figurehead, isn't she? Or at least like between her and Hunter. Wasn't the last time that we saw the McMahons all on TV, it was announcing that they no longer can control the show? It's the fans that are going to run raw? Oh, I, I didn't realize we were still... That was a long in, time ago. I don't know if we've gone through that. Uh, we, we've gone through many authority figures. Well, there are um, no fans right now. Maybe to establish her, um, her power, she could have introduced herself and said, uh, 
this is my list. And I put Gallows and Anderson at the top of it. What do you mean? What? what she list? fired them. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> she calls the match a horror show last night, but Banks is not the champion because she did not win. But neither did Oscar. So next week they are going to have a match. And Sasha, you can lose by pin, submission, disqualification, or my hope that we get a count out that leads to the undisputed champion. Uh, and this includes Bailey getting involved. So if Bailey gets involved, it could cost Banks the title that she does not hold. But all of this goes for Asuka as well. They didn't really play this out that Kyrie, Kyrie could fuck you up too. So, mm, um, interesting. Well, we're not going to get that match though. Um, no, but who knows? Maybe they'll shoot the angle and that's, that's her farewell. <laughs> Everyone wants this match after Kyrie turns on her. Hmm. Um, so anyway, that's the match for next week. Uh, but first up is Bailey and Kyrie Sane non title match. Yeah, like doing uh, Asuka Sasha again on TV tomorrow tells me that their priorities right now are TV and not just these network specials. I mean, if you're somebody who tuned in on Sunday expecting a result out of that Asuka Sasha match and you see this, I'm sure you'd be annoyed. Um, but I guess WWE thought it was worth, you know, risking your annoyance to um, make for another TV main event. Bailey and Kyrie saying uh, this was in the third hour. And I have to say, like, they really loaded up the third hour this week. Mm -hmm. Like They put all the big stuff and it ended up being like this third hour. I thought was very strong. I agree. Um, very good match between these two. Uh, Banks is yelling at Kyrie. Get up, you stupid idiot. And Bailey gets perched on the top and takes the foot stomp. They go through a break. Uh, Bailey's got this uh, standing Kimura lock on. Shayna Baszler is watching backstage and Charlie interviews her. And says, do you have a vested interest in this match? No, Charlie. I'm waiting for the remote so I can change the channel. <laughs> she says, I've beaten everyone else in the locker room. I don't have a match. And says, should I just go to catering? They've got a real hang up on catering right now. Or should I just go out there and be a fan? Yes, Charlie. I have a vested interest in this match. Like a shark when it sees prey in the water. I swear to Christ, I thought she was going to bite Charlie in the back of the neck here. So so she wasn't being a vampire. She was being a shark. She's a shark now. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of cool. Shark cage match in the future. Yes. She is going to be revealed to have eaten Braun Strowman. Oh, wow. Man. Awesome. Uh, yeah, like very scripted words in something like this, but kind of cool. Sane hits a sliding D into the corner, and then Bailey, I guess watching uh, Seth Rollins earlier in the night, snaps the right arm over the top rope. Um, uh, Bailey does this to Sane, and then is wrenching on the arm until Sane shoves her down. She fights back. There's a spear by Kyrie. She calls for the insane elbow and hits it, but Bailey gets her foot on the bottom rope. Sane then drives herself into this hard knee strike that Bailey gets up. Suplex by Bailey, hits her own elbow off the top, only gets a two count, and she goes for the Bailey to belly, but Sane counters it with a roll up, pinning the champion. Um, really strong match between these two, I thought, and a, a clever finish. An absolute surprise of a finish. I mean, obviously, reports are, are that Kyrie is on her way out, and I certainly didn't expect to see her pinning the SmackDown champion. So, uh, unless we get a rematch next week, um, I mean, that's, Maybe we do. That's what it seems to point towards. And I'm, I'd am i be perfectly happy with it because I thought this is... Uh, maybe you could even do it Friday because, I mean, she is a SmackDown wrestler, isn't she? Oh, yeah. We didn't even bring up the fact Bailey had a match on Raw tonight. Yeah. So maybe they'll do a rematch on SmackDown and then you still have room for her to do something on Raw. The that, next is, week. that is true. That is true. That with, with the uniqueness of this... Uh, well, I mean, the fact was, like, this was... It was, you know, reported that, like, today was the last taping. Um, hmm. SmackDown's being done tomorrow. So... Okay. Yeah, who I knows? mean, yeah, we will see. Uh, really good match. I mean, certainly had a level of significance attached to it for for me as a viewer, knowing that this was one of Kyrie's last in the WWE. Um, so I was watching this with almost like as much uh, you know excitement as like one of her big NXT matches, and 
I think they were given the time. Bailey did a great job on her end of beating Kyrie and just setting her up to do what Kyrie does best, and that's sell, 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 and give us that amazing desperation she's always shown as an underdog. I think she is one of the best in the entire company at showing that baby face fire. And it's a shame we never got more of it on her raw run. Uh, but at least, you know, she can end strong here. Where do you see Asuka ending up at SummerSlam? Yeah, because I, I thought I thought it would have been a rematch with Sasha. Um, if that's not the case, I mean, they are still... Oh, they're yeah, hinting but, at ba- they're definitely hinting at Baszler being involved in this title picture now. That's right, yeah. So that'll probably be it, Oscar Shayna. And I guess the bigger question is, um, are we going to get Bailey and Sasha? Because with Oscar, if Oscar isn't part of that, like I, I don't know what else you do with Bailey and Banks at this point. So I, I think it's like I think that's what's going on right now. Like, is this program going to get prolonged, or are they going to shoot this for SummerSlam? Is there a big enough like women's tag team in the company right now that you could see them defend the belts? No. I think it would have to be a case where you bring out a team to like that. That could get you through something. If you brought a team out, like I I know that they have pushed for uh, like Bailey, Bailey's done like interviews pushing for that. Um, Hmm. I don't know. I I honestly believe that um, when Trish did that match with Charlotte, that that was, that was it for her. I don't know if she's looking to do another match. I, I don't know how much I'm crazy about that idea, but um, it's an option out there because, yeah, you haven't built up any other tag teams to for SummerSlam to be a big show. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll we'll see. Like they they have certainly like held up on the hints of them breaking up, but I, I don't know where else those two end up. And they're such huge players at the moment that you know just having a, a run of the mill opponent this month would seem kind of a waste of both of them yeah i have to like you know think about like who on the smackdown side they're really like heating up i mean naomi um yeah uh lacy naomi just got yeah she just got beat by lacy um lacy doesn't really gel with bailey or sasha right now with those two as heels Mm -hmm. um um (laughs) naomi would have been my pick but i i don't know where they're going in that direction alexa's always there um yeah so Oh, uh, we shall see. But yeah, I certainly see like S- Sasha getting some s- some sort of singles match uh, or or a tag team match. But it's it's really hard to think about right now. Uh, but definitely Shayna and like if the rumored thing was that Kyrie was supposed to be injured on her way out, that's a perfect spot for Shayna. Yes, definitely. I, I, maybe that's that's probably the most logical pl- way to go. It's um, Shayna taking out Kyrie mm-hmm. to get to Oscar. I, I would think that would be the easiest path to go to. It takes Asuka out of whatever Bailey and Sasha are doing, and yeah, it'll it'll be interesting how that that match is booked and what directions we have coming out of it. I'm gonna be really sad. Like, what are they gonna do to poor Kyrie to be a to set up a career ending injury? She's gonna get eaten by a shark. Some biting must must be involved. Drew McIntyre is interviewed backstage. He's hurt from the match with Ziggler, um, but he's going to go to the ring to talk about his future. He says that Ziggler almost had him on Sunday, but almost doing things is the story of Dolph Ziggler's career. But now it's onward and upward. I want a worthy opponent for SummerSlam. Dolph Ziggler comes out, and he is just beyond comedy at this point. Like He is just, uh, he's the boy who cried Dolph. The, the, it, every like that is his mutant power like no matter how much this guy loses no matter how poorly he is booked no matter how bottom of the barrel he becomes as a challenger his goal every time is to get you to buy into seeing him in another match and um you know to varying degrees of success but um i i think he can handle that position better than most yeah, th- there was a great line that Drew got almost under his breath because as soon as he said he wants a worthy opponent for SummerSlam and Ziggler's music plays, you hear him say, "It sure as hell not you." <laughs> and Ziggler, Drew is like a real dick here, and like, oh, I, very entertaining for, yeah. for a lot of a lot of baby faces. There might be pushback on, but Dolph Ziggler is the eternal punching bag that this works well for. <laughs> yeah, sure. Ziggler says that he saw fear in Drew's eyes on Sunday. And I almost had my moment that I've deserved. Drew turns him down for a rematch. 
Dolph, you're embarrassing yourself. He nails this idiot with the Glasgow kiss. Ziggler tells him, don't walk away. And he offers Drew the option to pick the time and the stipulation for the rematch. And then in the highlight of the show, one of the N extras yells, eye for an eye. <laughs> Dude, I, I can't remember the last time I have laughed out loud at a moment on Raw. But this occurred. Eye for an eye. <laughs> I thought this was awesome. These fan, these these Ed extras who have to stand here for hours are probably so tired of being on stand up duty for all these shows that they're going to entertain themselves. So more power to these people. Maybe with these masks, they feel like there's a level of an- anonymity that they won't get caught. <laughs> hey, who said that? <laughs> I laughed. Kona I thought Reeves. this was so funny. <laughs> I'm going to say Kona yes. Reeves, or it was uh, Boa. Might have been Boa. Yes. Please DM one of us. Let us know your identity. You're, you're the highlight of this show for me. Drew accepts the rematch if he can pick the stipulation. But much like Dolph, he's not going to tell him the stipulation until right before the bell rings. And they did not give a time for this match. They didn't say next week. Um, this has to be a Raw match. Um, didn't, didn't they show a graphic afterwards that said next week? Did they? Okay, they I might have missed that. They had a graphic in the bottom corner during the main event saying, next week, Drew picks the stipulation. I was a little confused, too, because I could have okay. sworn said, like, Drew, I could have sworn Drew said, like, two weeks or something. Drew definitely said two weeks, but I, I rewound it, and he didn't make it super clear that it was happening in two weeks, but he did say two weeks uh, in this response. So uh, I was definitely uh, confused, too, but, like, the graphic did say, next week, Drew picks the stipulation, and he did say he wouldn't. Pick the stipulation until the match. Right right before the bell rings. I, the way that they have booked Dolph, this, this almost feels like Dolph is leaving. Oh, really? I don't... This, to me, is just another Dolph Ziggler. What, what other stipulation is this guy going to pick other than if you lose, you leave forever? Um, Extreme rules for Drew, not for Dolph. <laughs> yes. Um... You've got to pick a new ring name. Oh, okay. You have to retire Dolph Ziggler. You've got to go back to being Nikki from the Spirit Squad. (laughs) Big Show is in the back. He says Randy Orton is the most dangerous man in WWE. He's had an incredible year. He's seen what he did to Edge and Christian. And they had tried to show uh, Orton over the years that there's more to life than living up to your last name. And all of them helped Orton out of a dark hole. And he has sadistically taken each of them out. And now I'm on his list. And my career and health could be in jeopardy. And maybe the voices in his head got too loud. But the sadistic legend killer is back. And he remembers traveling on the road with Randy. Where they really bonded. Because they they were hammer and chisel. I was the hammer. He was the chisel clarification that was absolutely necessary and they bonded over how each of them was presented in this business and they likened it to tigers that can't change their stripes big show was this giant while randy orton was presented as a third generation star and each knew the pressures of how they of the hand they were dealt and all of that has changed now And now Randy has a boot with his name on it. And he asks if this is the end of the line for Big Show. And he says, maybe it is. But there's this thing about tigers. Because they're the most dangerous when they face the end. And they'll do anything to survive. And Big Show is going to do anything to make sure Randy Orton doesn't write the end of his story. Which is now going to include the best promo of this guy's career occurring <laughs> 25 years into his career. It was really good. This really was a good. really great promo, I, I thought. I especially love the way the both this and the Orton promo were presented with just these guys looking straight into the camera. Um, like, it's pure. It's just like wrestler talking directly to the audience. Didn't need, um, you know, any sort of like interviewer. Didn't even need them to come out. Really good sh- uh, promo. I, I, I think... You know, I I feel like overall in this feud in 2020, Big Show has done really well. He's like really shown his growth and maturity as a performer, as a promo. Um, They've been really strong. Yeah, I I thought both had really strong promos. Like they really built up to this 
main event. Like they put all their chips in to build up this third hour with, um, you know, they had a great match with Bailey and Sane. They had this Drew segment and then you put on this main event. So, you know, the third hour is always very tough, but they, they went all in to build up this, this third hour. Um, and quality wise, it was very strong. Uh, Orton comes out, no Ric Flair. Um, and the match begins and Big Show goes after the arm of Randy Orton and they state Big Show's been here since Orton debuted. He knows all of Orton's past problems with the collarbone. And Big Show delivers a spear and brings out a table. And this is when Andrade and Garza run down after Big Show. They drive him into the post. Zelina Vega is looking on approvingly and... They hold him up for Randy when the Viking Raiders, fresh off their advice from Ron Simmons, run down. They stop Angel and Andrade and set them up to commercial break. Ron Simmons told them to do this? Exactly how this played out, yes. Wow, okay. We come back from break. Show hits a choke slam. He sets up for the knockout punch. Orton bails. And then Big Show sets up Randy on a table. And Big Show goes for a Vader bomb. This did not end well. Orton gets out of the way. Big Show Vader bombs himself through the table. Orton is smiling. He hits the RKO, but Big Show kicks out. Then Orton takes this guy apart with multiple chair shots to the body and back, draping DDT off the top, signals for the RKO, hits a second one, and this time pins the Big Show. And as Big Show is struggling after the match to get up on the ropes, Orton backs up, hits the punt kick, and tells Big Show, I told you. Just like all the others, one more legend down. And this felt like the end of the big show. The big show show has ended. Wow. This was the season finale. Series Series finale. finale. Yeah. Uh, You know, this was a really slow paced match, I would say, for a main event. But I really enjoyed it. I thought every move felt significant. Had a story that was very uh, strong. And I think in the body of the match, really easy to follow. Everything these two did, I thought was really captivating. And like, I think, again, like showed like a veteran's maturity and being able to get the most out of every move. I thought they 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 made the most of this. I mean, you're not going like Big Show in a main event position. That, that's pretty tough in 2020. I thought they worked this this really well. It was a slow Randy Orton style of match, but he's with a giant. Uh, with a giant, it really worked. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've always felt Orton and Big Show have typically like I'm not saying they're uh uh steamboat flair, but they have always had like a pretty good chemistry together because I think they, they get the most out of the, the size discrepancy. And Orton is, you know, just firing on all cylinders. This was a logical end to this match. Um it should write off Big Show. And the only thing this might have been missing is that um you know, no hint towards uh, Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton, but I guess they're going to prolong that by at least another week because that appears to be the destination for SummerSlam. They do have like, what is it, four, five, four or five shows left for SummerSlam? Yeah. And you also have to wonder, like, where was Ric Flair figured into this? And when did they know that they did not have Ric Flair? Like, not in enough time that they updated the graphics. So I, again, I don't even know if Ric Flair was was in Florida or not. Um, but if so, like, was he figured into the, this some closing angle here? Perhaps, yeah. Uh, you know, like for what what has essentially become like a month long detour for Randy Orton prior to you know get it, perhaps getting to the Drew McIntyre program for SummerSlam. I thought Orton and Show did really well, creating something really out of nothing. Uh, certainly, like one of the big complaints is like, man, what what is Big Show doing in a featured role when like that role? this role could have been given to somebody on the undercard so that they can get that value. And absolutely in an ideal world, that would be like what you would do. Something tells me that they perhaps either, I don't know, perhaps don't feel like they have enough star power on anybody else uh, on the roster. And they feel like they might have that recognition on the big show. Maybe it's also the fact that these veterans want to work with other veterans, you know, who can deliver like the type of, uh, perhaps mm, more like uh, emotive storytelling that I think you kind of got to see here with the big show and, and Randy Orton. Um, I don't know how many new viewers this program would have attracted, how many old viewers this, this, this feud would have attracted, but I, I was like, th- I thought it was like strong, you know, good TV. What's your prediction? Um, if I throw out um, last week, it Ooh. was, 
the all-time low, 1,561,000. I'm going to say um, 1.9 million, higher or lower. Um, last week was how much? 1,561,000. Oh, man. Uh, I, you know, like there, I, I definitely feel like there's a level of buzz coming out of the horror show, but I, I don't think it was a good level of buzz. Um, but sometimes that might lead to people being curious to see the, you know, the result too. But if I had to guess, I'm going to say lower. I'm going to say like 1.8, 1.85, somewhere in that range. I don't, th- I don't see it hitting 1.9. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree with that. Um, but we'll see. I mean, they have the, like this match was promoted all week. They're coming off a pay-per-view that did have, um, engagement. I mean, there was, there was a lot of <laughs> buzz over this. It. Uh, engagement. Yes. That's, uh, that's like the, uh, the entanglement, uh, definition. All right. That was raw. Um, I thought, I, I, I thought I was watching two different companies, uh, from Sunday night to Monday night. It felt like two different worlds I was watching and, you know, raw, I would say like the first two hours, I can't say like there was anything spectacular, but it was moving along. I enjoyed that six man tag, um, with, with Ali coming on onto raw and I really didn't have any like strong complaints about it, but the third hour, um, you know, usually that's the hour that drags you down. Uh, it propped up this show for me and ended up like I I left this show really enjoying it based off that third hour. Last night certainly had a, a promise of a lot of spectacle, and there was a lot of spectacle uh, where they failed. It was perhaps giving you, you know, just the the proper wrestling and this edition of raw seemed to have like more clean finishes than last we, night we had show. clean finishes in every match mm-hmm. so you know if, if if that's what you're you're primarily looking for um i think you would have been more satisfied watching this edition of raw and and again that maybe goes to you know tell you their shift in in mentality of leaving sort of like the craziness on the pay-per-views but like still giving you enough to look forward to on uh, a TV show. Um, I think like balancing it out like that, I'm not against that at all. Like, you know, it might, to me, it doesn't water down these pay-per-views at all. Like there's still some, some big event that they're, you know, getting you to hooking you for, for, for these pay-per-views. And if it means these pay-per-views are shorter while you're giving, you know, me something to look forward to on a random edition of raw or, and SmackDown, I think that makes everything better. Doesn't it? I I think that you can certainly like, I I do not want to see too many extreme rules repeats uh, of shows like that. I think that there is a happy medium to be reached. I think that you can extend programs, but I think that you, I think you're asking a lot of people like, Hey, these are a month's worth of focus towards these shows that I I do feel you have to reward that audience. Uh, While at the same time, I think it is very clear TV is, TV is the absolute number one priority right now for the company. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, and I, I don't blame that, that uh, priority either. Um, at the same time, I don't think it means you have to just throw in the towel on a pay-per-view. Um, you can have your crazy concepts, but I think you also have to um, service the audience that is t- dedicating three hours on a, on a Sunday night to these shows that in theory, your TV ha- has built up to this climax and you can keep programs going. But I think that there is an expectation level that I think many felt was not met on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, also one where I mean, so, so, so this like network model was built off of the pay-per-view model mm-hmm. back when, you know, uh, you made your, most of your money on pay-per-view and you use your TV to try to get people to pay you for your pay-per-view. Um, but let's say the WWE was created in 2020 and instead you have the thing that is driving you the most money for you being these TV shows and these TV rights deals. Meanwhile, you also had a supplementary TV network or sorry, uh, over the top network that you serve to your most hardcore fans. That's where you serve your archives and that's where you serve your monthly specials. Would they still book these shows the same way? I still feel that if, if you were just starting from scratch, um, I do feel that having that destination does help your television as opposed to if we just had Raw and SmackDown every week and you didn't have these shows to build to. Everything built to but, uh, television. But you can make your destinations a big edition of Raw or a big edition of SmackDown. 
yeah, you can, you can do that. Uh, you, you could do that once a month. Um, yeah, it, it's hard. It's just, that's, that's the business that they came from that you peak towards a certain card. And that's the one that people have to pay for. And I think their belief is that the way Raw and SmackDown have been presented, that's what we're going to continue to do because anything above and beyond that, that's where we want to send people to the network. And we're fulfilling our contracts with these, with this television and how, how much do we put on TV versus how much do we hold back? Like the network is not a priority model at this point. The WWE network could disappear tomorrow and it's not going to greatly impact the, the health of this company. Um, but I do think it's a tool that they want to have, but also one that, I mean, they were not shy about saying they were willing to like these pay-per-views I feel exist with the hope that when the, uh, the economy rebounds that they can revisit selling off these pay-per-views to another mm -hmm. streaming service yeah. and they represent that much more. I think that's the value of these pay-per-views in their mind in 2020 and not so much building up this network that they see what the level is and it's going to fluctuate and dip, uh, you know, in either direction at different times of the year. Maybe at WrestleMania, we'll have a big influx, but th this is not a thing that's going to have those three to four million subscribers that we hope for. Certainly, like during this, like, you know, uh, pandemic period, everything's kind of out the window. And this is maybe the time that you see them readjust because they're not trying to peak for big gates, which will, I think will, will make a difference. Yes. Um, but yeah, for the time being, I mean, clearly they, they want to put as much attention to the TV side of things as they can. When I was looking at last year's Extreme Rules card, there was something like 14 matches on that goddamn oh, show. God. Oh, God. And. I much prefer this model where it's okay, fine. Have your, um, say you have like 11 matches that you're peaking for and take four of them and spread them out on television and give us a seven match show. I, I am all awesome. for that idea. Like I, I did not need to see, can you imagine the extreme rules with Orton and big show on it? That would have been forgotten yeah. with a bar fight with mm -hmm. God knows what else would have been on there. And instead it's like, you, you're going to get, three to four shows like Matt Riddle and styles would have been on there instead. Like you've spread them out and their focuses for an entire week to build mm -hmm. SmackDown didn't have a big jump in numbers, but I think over time, if you start to condition people that you're going to get one big match each week that um, I'm curious to see how Wharton and big show does tonight. Cause it, it was promoted hard. It would be as if the UFC took all the main events that they were going to do in one month, put them on one show rather than spread them out through you know throughout all the minor shows that they've had all the fight nights yeah like they're yeah this could be third or fourth on a pay-per-view card or it could headline its own fight night yeah mm -hmm. that's a good uh analogy let's go to the forum forum.postwrestling.com tonight's raw this is this is where the forum's gonna like give this a passing or a failing grade for sure i'm predicting they're at least gonna give it a pass but let's see you are tonight a 4.94. Wow. I am very curious what, like, I, I will grant you that I'm probably bell curving slightly because I just hated that pay-per-view on Sunday coming off of it, that tonight felt like such a better show, but honest to God, like, uh, taking away any of those negative feelings on the pay-per-view, I did feel like that, that third hour was, I, I really have no complaints about that, that third hour. Well, let's see what they have to say. Paul from New Jersey starts things out. Help me out here. Was last night's match a globe luxation for globe luxation affair? I'm owed an eye. PC crowd actually made Seth laugh during his promo. Glad to see Mustafa Ali back, but I'd be curious to see how he's being booked in six weeks. The show then came to a screeching halt for me when I saw Peyton Royce without Billy Kay. I recall Neil pointing out the Aussies were hanging out with Kayla Braxton weeks ago. I hope I'm wrong, but Kay's absence seemed unusual. I like the angle with Stephanie trying to boost the ratings, uh, 6.5. Uh, when McIntyre was talking about stipulations, did you guys catch somebody from the crowd yell out eye for an eye? Yes. All right. We got Aaron from Brampton who says, did you guys find it odd that the commentators were almost condemning Seth on winning his match? The whole narrative felt like Seth did something wrong when the objective of the match was to take the eye out. I understand the act was horrific, but would they be speaking the same way if Ray had won? Uh, probably not. Um, cause you know what? Announcers are biased. Heels or baby faces. There's always some bias. Again, it's where I think the marketing of this, they were kind of, they were 
servants to this marketing because I think in a traditional sense, you wouldn't have made this so overt about an eye going out. And to for Seth to do this in the match, it would have been such a dastardly act to have re-injured Ray's eye. Um, but if Ray did it, it would have been, oh, he got revenge. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, there is... I mean, again, can't it was pointed out in the promo. Ray, Ray chose this stipulation. Mm, yeah. He says, I've been loving everything Sasha and Bailey have been involved with, including the match last night, but the title situation makes no sense. From what I heard, Stephanie McMahon made it seem as if the Raw Women's title was vacant. Did you guys get that as well? That was a sense I got. Uh, and I don't know if that'll be recognized as, uh, as that way in the record books. I don't even know if at this point WWE keeps record books or if they strictly exist on like a Wikipedia or something. That's and I don't probably think, the home of uh, where they, they have it. I don't think they give a shit what the record says other than like the 24-7 title or like Charlotte's Reigns. Whenever it's convenient, they will recognize it. But something like, oh, no, there's a vacant spot in the title uh, where Asuka's reign would otherwise, you know, be be continuous. I don't think they care about that at all. No. Uh, so Aaron also says, while I'm not too big on the continuation of Dolph Drew, I wouldn't mind it if it was something that was concluded within a week or two before Drew starts his feud with Orton. I liked what Drew had to say in his promo. It's not even a champion. It's not often a champion says to a heel challenger that you just lost. I just love how Drew's been presented as a sensible and smart baby face. Even though he accepted the challenge, he did it in a way that screwed with Dolph. Yeah, I, I enjoyed Drew in this segment tonight. I thought he was he was pretty he was very funny. The personality is definitely like very unique and very natural, and yeah, yeah. He's like he's he's like a solid baby face that I can see people just getting behind. Like this is a guy who's very confident. He is successful, and he doesn't get outsmarted by by these heels either. And that's in this day and age, that's a very tough character to portray because often it then goes into the territory of you know he is booked too strong and he's. He gets a negative reaction from people, but I mean, we're not in an era where we, we've got fans that are having that reaction, nor do I feel that would have been elicited with Dolph Ziggler opposite him. Maybe not, but the Heath Slater thing, though? Maybe. I yes. don't know. It's it's really hard to tell with this Drew, Drew thing uh, without without a crowd. So, and that's helped them in many ways without having an audience there to like, you know, derail the push that they have. Kyle from Windsor. Guys, I'm assuming that things won't be somewhat normal again until closer to the end of the year. With that being said, do you think that WWE could hold off on some of the returns of people that haven't been seen and save them for the Rumble? Or will they rush them back to TV, whether they have good ideas for them or not? Great to see Ali back. He looks great. Um, I don't know which people you're referring to um, other than, you know, uh, a handful of the names that haven't been on TV for a few weeks. But they are definitely not holding off on anybody Till the rumble of the level of a Nia Jax or an Apollo Crews. How about a Roman Reigns? You expect him by then? No, I, I think if Roman Reigns said tomorrow I'm coming back, I think he would be on. Look at how much pressure they are putting on themselves for TV. There's no way that it's it's all theoretical. Like the, you can't say 100 percent the Royal Rumble is going to be in front of fans right now. I don't mm -hmm. think you could guarantee that. And if Roman Reigns is ready to come back, they would have him on SummerSlam. I think 100 percent. Yeah. We got Andrew from, from Cape Breton who says, WWE were very smart tonight in their programming. They didn't put Flair on TV. I did believe that even after admitting his wife had COVID-19, he was going to show up and be the anti-Moxley. But thankfully, common sense prevailed. Well, we don't know any of that. We don't know if um, yeah, he was I, I would or... say that there, there would definitely be um, questions to ask if Flair had gone to Florida and, this, and with knowledge that his wife has COVID-19 because mm -hmm. then... It's either a case of it's. Did he inform we, WWE? You know, th that's the question. Did he inform yeah. them or not? I um, hope so. And, and we don't know. We don't know if he yeah. was in Florida or not. But I mean, he was promoted on that graphic all night long. Uh, he also says this show definitely seemed like the script was thrown out, as was rumored earlier in the day, as it was a v very much a heavy wrestling based show with little talking. Yeah, uh, there were certainly rumors and reports about that. John, did you get the sense while watching the show that that was the case? I mean, in certain cases, um, you know, I, I keep bringing up like the flair thing that wouldn't have surprised me that he was figured into this just based off what we saw last week. And I mean, this this graphic that they were I, I think there was even points where they they referenced that that flair was going to be there with uh, didn't Big Show even bring up flair in the promo, I think. So I don't think he said he, he was going to be there tonight. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not certain. Anyway, uh, I, I'm. 
certain that, yeah, there could have been, you know, people that were not available that maybe they thought they were. And is this going to be a regular occurrence in WWE where they're now doing testing and they've got to wait for these results and that might screw up plans. Like that's Mm -hmm. something that they're, they're going to have to realize is going to be a burden for them, but it's one like you have to be testing now. There's no question about that. And that's going to come with the, the problem that two weeks of television could get screwed up because this person cannot do the tapings. Like all things considered, I actually enjoyed the show this week. So I don't know what that says about, um, Last how many times have we how many times have we watched the show? The biggest example being after the Saudi Arabia show with that SmackDown, mm-hmm. where a hastily thrown together show typically is a very well received show. I I don't know. And I don't know how many examples of like hastily put together shows that we've absolutely hated might have existed too. Um yeah, I'm not sure. Um yeah. Uh you're up. Oh, are you sure about that? Um, All right. I'm nominating you for this one. All right, we go to Brand- Brandon from Cornwall, formerly known as New Jersey. Greetings, my Philly Jays fans. It is I. Are they moving to Philly? Um, I, th- I think that one of the rumors they've too? got like five locations. Um, I-, I had heard about like Pittsburgh as one. Um, maybe maybe Philly's in the mix I heard too. Buffalo, Buffalo, yes, Buffalo. They've got to like upgrade the the park. It sounds like it's not really at major league uh, mm. levels. What what a disaster! Wouldn't I, I'm so glad I, uh, I I am not involved in major league baseball because it just seems like the craziest thing to try and uh, logistically pull this off. Specifically, the position the Jays are in. But hey, uh, it is I, Brandon. Been a minute since we spoke, and I just want to say one thing before we get to the evening's proceedings, and that is. I'm sorry for my appearance yesterday. I was flustered and made an inappropriate joke about Brutus Beefcake and the parasailing accident. And for that, I'm sorry. Eh? Now give me a minute and let me address my Spanish fans in the audience. Y solo quiero decir una cosa. Ha <laughs> ha ha. I got you good way, you son of a gun. <laughs> Anywho, raw. Show and Norton worked hard. <laughs> that's that's all his feedback for Raw. <laughs> Got a few meanderings here. Way, you were slightly disappointed with the Seth Ray match. Was you were slightly disappointed that the Seth Ray match didn't turn into a gore video. It was a good match, but it needed more exploding heads. John, my guesses for the three empty seats next to EC3 were Judas Macias, Rob Terry, and John Cena or Mahabali Shira. Will I be right? Um Yeah, I I don't know about that. Rob Terry. What a I I just coincidentally saw like a a video today with with uh, Rob Terry from a uh, from TNA just out of nowhere and then he brings up Rob Terry here in this uh in this feedback um don't know about that don't know um, about that Brandon you got me good Brandon got and me. our lives did change forever on Saturday as Impact promised last one here is from Carl do you see Vince McMahon going to the well again to try and beef up that SummerSlam card? Brock Lesnar, Bill Goldberg, Undertaker, John Cena. Do you think any of these will be receiving a phone call in the coming weeks? Um, hmm. Okay, let's go through this. Um, uh, the Observer had a report last week that Lesnar is not uh, figured in to SummerSlam plans. Um, anything can change, but uh, that was the report last week. Bill Goldberg... Um, I guess you would give a small chance, maybe, if you want to build up something. Um, the key with Goldberg was that he w- very much would work with Paul Heyman. Well, like that was the guy that he would typically uh, work with. And now Heyman is not in any kind of power role. Um, and I don't know if that affects Goldberg in any way, if that uh, gives him any, you know, less interest to come back and do something. I don't know. But. I guess that's a possibility. Undertaker, I'm going to say no. And John Cena, I'm going to say no. Yeah, I'm going to say no to almost all of them. Uh, You know, can you have, I don't know, some sort of skit, some some sort of thing with it? Like The Undertaker, for instance, like who's a bit of a, a, you know, relevant name at the moment? Perhaps. Uh, What if he comes out into the ring and does a QA? and a That uh, with the N-Extras? With the N-Extras, yes. I would watch that on pay-per-view. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, it's honestly hard for me to see any of those names having some sort of involvement. All right. Thanks, everybody, for your feedback. Thank you for tuning in. 
We're going to be back on Tuesday night. Rewind away, tackling Pro Wrestling Noah's Destiny card from the Tokyo Dome, July of 2005. A show that clocks in at four hours and 12 minutes away. Yes, and I will be talking about it in uh, less than 12 hours with uh, our guest, Bruce Lord, as well as John Pollock. So look forward to receiving that in your feed tomorrow evening. Look forward to that. That will be available for all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. Uh, you can pick up the MCU shirt, store.postwrestling.com, and check out all of our news and shows up at postwrestling.com. Goodbye, everyone. Way has a long night ahead of him. <laughs>